There are very few elements that invite as much confusion as the distinction between a ridge board and a ridge beam in the design and construction of wood framed structures. Both members occupy the peak of a gable roof where they run horizontally along the ridge line that joins the upper ends of opposing rafters. To an untrained eye, they may appear interchangeable. However, in principle, they are very different and confusing them in practice can lead to costly mistakes in construction or even catastrophic failure under code-level gravity loading conditions. Therefore, understanding the distinction between the two is essential for both safe construction and clear communication in design practice. In this video, we are going to explore the critical differences between ridge boards and ridge beams. We will examine how each functions within a roof system as far as load path is concerned. Additionally, we will highlight code requirements in the International Residential Code that provide design and construction guidelines. Before venturing into a detailed exposition of ridge boards and ridge beams, let us first discuss the broader context of the roof forms where these elements are used. Ridge boards and ridge beams are used in the framing of gable roofs and hip roofs. The gable roof is perhaps the most familiar and visually distinctive roof type in residential construction. It consists of two sloping planes that intersect at a central ridge, forming a clean triangular profile when viewed from the end of the structure. While the geometry of a gable roof is simple, its framing requires careful consideration of rafter spacing, alignment along the ridge and load path to the supporting walls. The ridge line serves as the spine of the roof, where opposing rafters converge. It is along this line that either a ridge board or a ridge beam is installed to guide or support the rafters. Hip roofs, in contrast, present a more intricate structural challenge. Slopes extend on all four sides of the building, and the roof planes intersect along hips and the ridge line. The complexity of a hip roof underscores why understanding the role of ridge members is critical. Their function and load path directly influences the stability and overall performance of the roof. Since our focus on this video is on ridge beams and ridge boards, we do not need the complexity of hip roofs. Therefore, we will stick with gable roofs where our focus will be at the ridge and its influence on the rest of the roof. At this point, it is important to clarify that gable roofs and hip roofs are not exclusively framed with rafters and ridge boards or ridge beams. Manufactured trusses can replicate the same gable or hip forms without requiring either member. Trusses are prefabricated assemblies designed to transfer loads directly to the exterior walls, and their ridge lines do not require ridge beams or ridge boards. Therefore, our discussion excludes roofs that are framed with manufactured trusses. The fundamental difference between a ridge beam and a ridge board lies in the load path that is intended by the design. That is why Section R802.3 of the 2024 International Residential Code requires ridge beams to be used where ceiling joists or rafter ties do not provide continuous ties across the structure. Similarly, Section R802.4.4 specifies that where the roof pitch is less than 3 to 12, Structural members that support rafters such as ridges shall be designed as beams. The language of the code in these code sections feels almost as if the code anticipates that the roof will be conventionally framed with a ridge board and therefore a ridge beam is required where conventional construction limits or requirements are not met. Therefore, it seems that the best route to unpack these two systems is to start with conventionally framed roofs with a ridge board and then allow their limits to take us organically to ridge beams. If you take a ladder and lean it against a wall, your safety as you ascend the ladder largely depends on the measures that you have put in place to prevent the ladder from sliding laterally away from the wall at the base. This is because in addition to exerting a vertical force at the base which in this case is your full weight, the ladder also exerts a horizontal force. If the ground is rough, this horizontal force can be resisted by frictional resistance that is mobilized at the base of the ladder. Similarly, the vertical force from the load on the ladder produces an equal and opposite vertical reaction at the base. But what is happening at the top of the ladder where it leans against the wall? 
we have said that the full vertical load on the ladder is transferred at the base of the ladder to the ground. No vertical force is transferred from the ladder to the wall at the top of the ladder. However, the ladder is pressing against the wall and therefore transferring horizontal force to the wall. This force produces an equal and opposite reaction from the wall. According to the rules of static equilibrium, the horizontal force at the top of the ladder is equal and opposite to the horizontal force at the base. The same loading mechanism that we have observed for a ladder leaning against a wall applies to rafters framed to a ridge board. If we consider one half of the roof, the rafter is similar to the ladder that spans from the ridge to the base. The ridge board and the roof framing behind it functions as the wall in the ladder example. Therefore, the ridge board provides a surface for the rafters to lean on and does not offer any vertical support. All the vertical forces on this rafter are resisted at the bearing wall at the base of the rafter. In addition to the vertical reaction at the bearing walls, the rafter will also exert a horizontal force at the base just like the ladder in the example. Since the wood-framed walls are not designed to resist out-of-plane lateral forces acting at the top of the wall, the force is resisted by ceiling joists or rafter ties that are fastened to the opposing rafters to form a stable unit. On the other hand, the equal and opposite horizontal force at the top of the rafter is transferred to the ridge board which in turn transfers it to the other half of the roof or is balanced by the same but opposite force acting on the other side of the roof. According to section R802.3 of the IRC, a ridge board shall not be less than 1 inch in nominal thickness. Additionally, the same section states that it shall not be less in depth than the cut end of the rafter. This means that it needs to be deeper than the rafter because the cut end of a sloping rafter is deeper than the actual sectional depth of the rafter. As we have seen, the ridge board does not carry vertical load. However, the rafters framing to a ridge board must still be securely fastened to it. The requirements for fastening the ridge board to the rafters are provided in item 7 of the fastening schedule which is table 1 in section R602.3 of the International Residential Code. These fasteners serve a critical role in maintaining alignment and stability at the ridge. They prevent separation, twisting and gradual lateral displacement under long-term service conditions. In addition, the nails provide lateral restraint during construction, when the system has not yet been fully braced by ceiling joists, sheathing, or other components. In short, the fasteners at the ridge board are not intended to transfer vertical load, but they preserve the geometry that allows the conventional framing system to perform as intended. Therefore, we have seen that ridge boards are not isolated elements but part of a well-orchestrated system of essential elements that provide stability to a complex system. If you remove the ceiling joists or rafter ties, you are compromising the stability of the system because there will be no resistance to the outward thrust forces at the base of the rafter. That is why the IRC in section R802.3 specifies that for conditions where ceiling joists or rafter ties do not provide continuous ties across the structure, then the ridge shall be supported by a wall or a ridge beam designed in accordance to accepted engineering practice. Similarly, if the pitch of the roof is lowered beyond a certain limit, it becomes almost impossible to prescribe adequate connections to maintain the stability of the system. The residential code puts this limit at a pitch of 3 to 12 in section R802.4.4. .4. Below this pitch, the code requires the rafters to be supported by a ridge beam which effectively eliminates horizontal forces. Therefore, let us now turn our attention to ridge beams. Quick pause before moving on. If you are a builder, designer, DIY enthusiast, or even planning your own home, and you're serious about understanding conventional wood framing, then I invite you to explore the residential wood framing design series at www.conventionalframing.com. This course methodically unpacks the International Residential Code's wood framing provisions into streamlined, practical lessons covering roofs, walls, floors, foundations, and wall bracing in wood-framed residential buildings. 
The crown jewel of this course is a complete structural design of a single-family home that culminates in the development of final construction drawings required for permit issuance. The training series is comprehensive, affordable, and available on demand. Please visit www.conventionalframing.com to learn more. Let us now get back to ridge beams. In framing parlance, ridge beams are referred to as structural ridges. This designation is a reflection of their role in supporting vertical loads like any other beam. When gable roof rafters are framed to a ridge beam, the beam is expected to carry vertical load from the rafters. This means that there is no functional difference between a ridge beam and a bearing wall. They are all designed to support bearing loads. The implication of this setup is that vertical forces acting on the rafters do not develop any horizontal reactions at the supports. The bearing wall provides a vertical support on one end of the rafter and a ridge beam provides a vertical support at the other end. The rafter acts like a horizontal joist that spans between supports and does not develop any horizontal forces. The elimination of horizontal reaction at the base of rafters unlocks significant architectural flexibility. The most immediate and recognizable advantage is the possibility to have vaulted ceilings. These are especially desired in high-end construction where rafters are exposed for a rustic or expressive architectural look. It is important to clarify that the absence of the structural requirement for ceiling joists in a ridge beam system does not imply that the joists cannot be installed. In fact, many homes framed with ridge beams also include ceiling joists for architectural or functional reasons. Ceiling joists may be used to define an attic space, whether for light storage or even as a habitable sleeping loft. In this context, their role is architectural and utilitarian rather than structural as far as the stability of the roof is concerned. The distinction is crucial. In a conventional rafter and ridge board roof, ceiling joists double as rafter ties, actively preventing the walls from spreading under roof loads. The roof becomes unstable if they are removed without any input to address the unbalanced forces. By contrast, in a ridge beam roof, ceiling joists are optional. They may be added or removed without compromising the stability of the roof structure. This subtle shift from the structural necessity of ceiling joists to one where their presence is optional is one of the hallmarks of a ridge beam system. Section R802.3 states that the ridge beam should be designed in accordance with accepted engineering practice which means that the IRC considers ridge beams engineering territory. Beyond the code requirement, it is only logical to expect that a ridge beam system will be designed by an engineer. The detailing of such a system involves a host of considerations that demand professional judgment grounded in structural mechanics. The first step is establishing a reliable load path from the rafters into the ridge beam. Rafters may be framed to bear directly on the beam which is often accomplished by lowering it so that the rafters sit on top. Rafters may also be framed on the side face of the beam and supported using proprietary or engineered hangers that must be sized to support both downward forces and uplift reactions. In the case of direct bearing, vertical gravity loads are transferred directly through compression at the bearing surface while uplift resistance may be provided using ridge straps or other connectors with sufficient capacity against the uplift loads. In addition to designing the ridge beam against gravity forces and wind uplift, the engineer must also design the ridge beam connections to support the bearing loads and resist wind uplift reactions. Subsequently, the engineer must follow those loads down to the foundations and ensure that sufficient load path is provided at all points to facilitate load transfer. Finally, the engineer must design the foundation supporting the posts and evaluate if there are any net uplift forces requiring column bases that are anchored to the foundations. In conclusion, a ridge beam transforms the ridge line into a load-bearing element, much like a floor beam or bearing wall. It fundamentally alters the mechanics of a roof under the oversight of a licensed engineer while granting far greater architectural flexibility. Thanks for watching and if you'd like more training on conventional construction, 
please check out www.conventionalframing.com. If you found this video helpful, be sure to like, subscribe, and stay tuned for more insights into wood framing.